Good morning and good afternoon. This is Kelly Jenkins Pulse with the Department of Labor Women's Bureau Regional Office in Region 9. I have a few housekeeping announcements before we begin. Our event will be recorded and we'll make a link available to everyone following the program. All of our attendees should please hit star six to keep their phones muted while our panelists uh, give their presentations. We do have four speakers today and we'll hold all questions to the end. If you think of a question during one of our presentations, please use the box in the lower right corner of your screen to type in a question and submit it to us at any time. Now, our very first speaker, and that is Bridget O'Farrell. Bridget is an independent scholar with the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers Project at George Washington University. Her research, writing, and advocacy in sociology and labor history focuses on occupational segregation, public policy, and women's equality in the workplace, especially in skilled trades and technical jobs. She has authored or collaborated on 10 books. The most recent one is She Was One of Us, Eleanor Roosevelt and the American Worker. Bridget is well known for workshops, writing, and leadership on union women's issues, particularly the concerns of tradeswomen. She has a master's degree from Harvard University and is a member of the National Writers Union, UAW Local 1981. The Women's Bureau was very fortunate to work with Bridget as we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the final report of the Pre President's Commission on the Status of Women. The insights she gathered help us frame our ideas about how to recognize this important 50th anniversary and commission a set of scholarly papers to document how the landscape for women has changed for women since that groundbreaking report. As many of you know, the Women's Bureau had scheduled a conference to commemorate the commission. However, the conference was not able to take place due to issues beyond our control, two government shutdowns. But we have been exploring other ways to continue to have a dialogue that reflects back on the commission report and looks forward to how the issues have evolved and identify the challenges that are still with us. All of our scholarly papers are now up on our website, and this is the first of the webinars that we plan to bring you to share this research. Our goal is to learn from the past, think critically about our present, and engage with you on discussion about the future. I'm very pleased that our webinar will be able to do that today. And now I'd like to welcome Bridget O'Farrell. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to join uh, all of you today to provide some historical background on the President's Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, could we have slide one? Okay. Uh, the commission was formed by President Kennedy's Executive Order 10980, signed on December 14, 1961. A commission was first called for, however, after the end of World War II. The Women's Status Bill was introduced in Congress in 1947. The goal was to lay out a comprehensive plan to achieve equality in the workplace while improving conditions for women and men. Led by 21 labor unions, it was proposed as an alternative to the Equal Rights Amendment, which many feared would eliminate hard-won protective labor laws for working-class women in the lowest paid and most dangerous jobs. The Equal Rights Amendment had been introduced in Congress every year since 1923, shortly after the suffrage amendment had passed. This effort was led by the National Women's Party and supported by groups like the Business and Professional Women and the Federation of Women's Clubs. Alice Paul, founder of the National Women's Party and architect of the ERA, saw the commission as a setup to defeat the adoption of the amendment. This new commission would try to bridge this divide between these two groups. As the commission began its work, there were 23 million working women, 17 million working full-time. One in three workers was a woman, and one-third of married women were in the labor force. The fastest-growing fastest growing group of women workers were mothers with young children. Women were concentrated in the lowest-paying jobs, $7 million in clerical jobs alone, and they earned $0.60 cents for every dollar earned by a man. Esther Peterson was executive vice chair of the commission, and she was the highest-ranking woman in the Kennedy administration, director of the Women's Bureau and assistant secretary of labor. She came from the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America and the CIO, and she was joined by several other union women in this effort. And as you look at the slide, Esther Peterson is to the right of President Kennedy. She wanted Eleanor Roosevelt, former First Lady and humanitarian, known as the First Lady of the World, 
to chair the commission to bring the seriousness and attention it deserves. Eleanor Roosevelt joined the commission, and she was also a member of the Newspaper Guild, FLCIO, for over 25 years. And Mrs. Roosevelt is to the left of uh, President Kennedy. The executive order uh, was very expansive, and Peterson was concerned with full-time homemakers as well as working women, with factory workers as well as professionals and executives. Issues for African-American women were very specifically addressed. And while employment and labor standards were central to the commission, they also addressed education, legal and financial issues, volunteer work, jury duty, retirement, and the full participation of women in the political process and in the appointment to leadership positions. The commission at the time was a very big deal, with 26 members, including 11 men and 15 women, cabinet secretaries, members of Congress, representatives from business, labor, education, religious groups, and women's advocacy groups. There were seven working committees, four consultation conferences, hearings, papers, and interviews. A total of over 300 people and organizations were involved, coordinated by a staff of 32 at the Women's Bureau, U.S. Department of Labor. This is a working session held uh, at the Roosevelt Home in Hyde Park in 1962. Eleanor Roosevelt and Esther Peterson are in the center. Uh, slide three. Equal pay was a high priority for the commission, and the Equal Pay Act was signed just months before the final report was released. While not perfect, the Equal Pay Act was a very important first step and the first time the federal government recognized discrimination against women in the workforce. Uh, the, women, uh, the Commission worked closely with the Women's Bureau and others at the Department of Labor to ensure passage of this important act. The final report of the Commission was issued uh, just several months later on October 3rd, 1963. The final report had 28 recommendations across seven areas. It was issued on October 11th because uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had passed away before uh, the work was completed, and this was her birthday, and it was issued then to honor her. I'll now highlight just a few of the co uh, comprehensive findings and recommendations. There were struggles, and this list of recommendations and issues were very much a compromise in 1963. The first area was education and counseling. The commission recommended flexible programs for women uh, in high school and adult education, and it included vocational education. The commission was very concerned about counseling, and uh, to find ways to overcome, quote, the obsolete assumptions about women's roles. The second area was home and community. And very importantly here, the co uh, commission recommended quality child care and after school care for all children, regardless of whether or not their mother was in the paid labor force. This section also covered uh, issues for domestic workers who had been excluded from many of the New Deal labor programs. And the commission said they wanted to bring domestic workers into the 20th century in terms of labor standards, wages, and working conditions. The third area was women's employment. And here the commission recommended an executive order to ensure equal opportunity in hiring, training, and promotion uh, for all of those uh, private sector employers with government contracts. The commission very importantly recognized that occupational segregation keeping women out of high-paid trades as well as professional and management jobs, significantly contributed to the wage gap. The fourth area was labor standards. And here, the commission recognized that on the federal level, uh, the right to organize and form a union and bargain collectively had been recognized, and they recommended that this kind of legislation be instituted at the state level. They also covered Again, expanding the wage and hour laws from which many women's occupations have previously been excluded. The fifth area, security of basic income, covered issues of social security. But very important for today is that the commission called for paid maternity leave. They lamented that 70 other countries had such policies and the United States did not. The United States still does not, and now there are 185 countries which, with such policies. The sixth area was women under the law, and this is where the commission addressed and came up with a compromise regarding the Equal Rights Amendment. This section was authored by, and a paper was written by Polly Murray, who was the first African-American woman to graduate from Yale Law School. 
And she drafted language arguing that women did indeed need to be covered under the Constitution, but that it could be done through the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. And they recommended uh, pursuing lawsuits to go to the Supreme Court. If that strategy didn't work, then they left open the door for an Equal Rights Amendment. Seventh uh, and final area of recommendations were women as citizens. And here they, we see them a major success as they were very concerned in 1963 about the fact that women were excluded from jury duty uh, in uh, several states or uh, there were other barriers on their participation. And now, of course, we have women sitting on the Supreme Court. They also recommended appointing women to top leadership positions, both in political parties, but also in government positions. They also recommended, and President Kennedy signed an executive order to appoint a cabinet-level committee to oversee the implementation of this report. It was a five-year committee, and there was an advisory committee, a citizens' council, to also assist in this effort. The report was front-page story in, in the newspapers and magazines. There were 84,000 copies uh, distributed in the first year. It was translated into Italian, Japanese, and Swedish. And books were uh, produced of the report, a hardback and a paperback edition, with a, an introduction by Margaret Mead, noted anthropologist. Uh, slide, uh, next slide, please. The commission said that it was indeed the report was an invitation to action. And it was an invitation to action then as it continues to be today. The two most important results, and there's some agreement about this uh, among historians, was that the commission for the first time on a national level recognized discrimination against women and in, all, in many areas of life, but especially in employment. And they also acknowledged uh, that both sex and race discrimination existed and created uh, uh, particular issues for minority women. The second critical thing that the commission did was that it established a network of state commissions on the status of women. And within several years, all of the states had a commission as well as many cities and some counties. And uh, this is what uh, historian Alice Kessler Harris uh, called uh, that it forms a base for continuing action. So that across the country, in each state and locality, women from all different walks of life were for the first time meeting and working and talking together. And while they would then later diverge from what the commission had recommended, uh, the core group was that a network was established. And I'll note that the uh, Women's Bureau then also convened conferences of these state commissions. And the conference in 1966 um, several of the women were getting very frustrated with the slow pace of progress by the government. And Betty Friedan, the author of The Feminine Mystique, a very important book published in 1963, uh, joined together with other women and they formed at that conference the National Organization for Women. Uh, some of the women involved in that came from the labor movement and from particularly the UAW. And the auto workers in Detroit actually supported it now for the first several years with administrative and mailing costs and the kind of basic uh, structure that they needed. Uh, debate continued on the Equal Rights Amendment, however, and union women uh, left now, and in 1974, 3,000 of them convened in Chicago to form the Coalition of Labor Union Women. And here you see Carolyn Davis and Lillian Hatcher, both of the UAW Women's uh, Department. I think it's important to note at this point that all three of these groups, the state commissions and their annual conference now and the Coalition of Labor Union Women, continue today as active organizations uh, on behalf of women's issues. Much of the uh, commission's work, however, was soon overshadowed by other events. President Kennedy's assassination, passage of the Historical Civil Rights Act of 1964, including Title VII, prohibiting discrimination in employment based on sex, President Johnson's war on poverty, and the emergence of the women's movement. In 1968, a final report was issued and the Federal Committee and Council disbanded, but the Commission had played an important role uh, in all of the activities that were going to move forward. Slide six, please. Then, as now, the invitation to action remains very open and relevant today. And as just two examples, we continue uh, to need, uh, have a great need to open all jobs to women, eliminating barriers 
in jobs like the skilled trades as well as the executive suites. As we know, in both of these categories, women remain 2.6% uh, uh, of women in skilled trades and less than 5% of women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. We also are addressing other very important issues such as child care and uh, paid parental leave. And one of an important aspect of work is the uh, scheduling for hourly workers. And that is where I believe that our, uh, our webinar is now going to focus. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hope this history has provided you with some background and the continuing importance of addressing women's issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. That was a really great summary of the Commission's work. It is now my pleasure to introduce Joan Williams, Founding Director of the Center for Work-Life Law at UC Hastings College of the Law. She received her law degree from Harvard Law School and has a master's degree in city planning from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a BA in history from Yale University. In addition to the scholarly papers Joan has written for the Women's Bureau, she is the author or co-author of over 90 academic articles and book chapters. She's also written eight books, most recently one with her daughter, Rachel Dempsey, called What Works for Women at Work, Four Patterns Every Woman Should Know. And I highly recommend that book for any young woman you know graduating today. Joan has received multiple awards and recognitions for her work and also currently teaches courses at UC Hastings on property, feminist legal theory, and a seminar on current issues on work-life law. She enjoys teaching students how to make creative legal arguments that push the limits of the law and is well regarded for her efforts to advance workplace flexibility and pioneering the legal field of work-life law. We're very pleased to welcome her to our webinar to share her insights on emerging best practices for hourly workers. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be here. I'll jump right in since we're a bit late. I'm Joan Williams, the founding director of the Center for Work-Life Law and distinguished professor at University of California, Hastings College of the Law, and thank you for that, that kind introduction. I'm going to be talking today about improving work-life fit in hourly jobs based on two reports, one that I co-authored with Heather Boucher of the Center for American Progress in 2010 called The Three Faces of Work-Family Conflict and the other that I co-authored with Penny Huang in 2011 called Improving Work-Life Fit in Hourly Jobs. So here's the outline. First, I'm going to talk about workplace workforce mismatch. In the 1960s, only 20% of mothers were employed, but today all adults are in the labor force in fully 70% of American families. The problem is the workplace has not caught up with the workforce. And in fact, what we have too often today is a workplace that's perfectly designed for the workforce of the 1960s. Next, I'll talk about how empl American employers can gain an em a competitive edge by resolving this mismatch. And finally, I'll give a best practice toolkit, toolkit to help you get from here to there. Next slide, please. Workplace flexibility is framed around professionals. The key work-family conflict issues of professionals are that they have long hours and rigid career paths. But these problems differ from the key problems of hourly workers. Next slide, please. This material is from the Three Faces of Work-Family Conflict Report. I'm going to talk today briefly about two faces of work-family conflict, the face among low-income families and the face among what Heather Boucher and I call the missing middle, the middle 50% of American families with um, a median income of, I can't remember, I think it's 62. OK, here are. Uh, low-income families. These are families in the bottom third of the American income distribution. Two-thirds of these families are headed by single mothers, and that's, of course, a very well-known um, and very important fact. If you look at the other third, the one-third that are headed by couples, those couples are twice as likely to handle childcare through tag-teaming. 
And that's, of course, where mom works one shift and dad works a different shift. And they hand the kids off between them as they transition between shifts. Low-income workers are much more likely to rely on family for child care than are other workers in the economy. And unfortunately, they're also quite likely to have children home alone. You see 14% of poor children, 9 to 11, are home alone, as well as almost unbelievably 7% of children between 5 and 8. Next slide, please. Child care affects not only mothers, it also affects fathers, grandmothers, and in fact, many, many relatives. Fathers certainly are involved in, in child care if they're tag teaming with their mothers, uh, the mothers of their children. This happens with both in married families and in families where the parents have never married. And in fact, <clears throat> reliance on parental care is sharply higher in this bottom third of the income distribution than it is among professionals. 26% of poor families rely on parental care. Only 14% of professional ones do. Grandmothers also play an extremely important role in child care in the United States. Between 20% and a third of grandmothers provide child care for their daughters. Grandmother-headed families are, in fact, the fastest growing family type in this country. And fully 40% of grandparents, this includes granddads as well as grandmas, had missed work due to family caregiving responsibilities, according to one study. If you're interested in the sites for all of this material, it's all in the Improving Work-Life Fit in Hourly Jobs or the Three Faces report. Now, it's not only mothers, fathers, and grandmothers who are involved in family care. Um, also, I remember there's one story of a woman who was the only person in her family who owned a car. And so she drove everybody in her extended family to all of the doctor's appointments, for example, that the elders needed. And so you have aunts and uncles also involved in providing child care and other forms of family care. And finally, older daughters in low-income families, unfortunately, often stay home from school when that's the only way that the, ch that the mother can go to work. Next slide, please. And it's not only child care. Elder care is much more common in low-income families than it is in more affluent families. Low-income families are more than twice as likely to provide long hours, 30 or more hours of care in the, um, per week. 50% of those caring for elders have taken time off work or arrived late in order to do so. And ill family members or disabled ones, of course, also require family care. Again, low-income families are much more likely to be providing this care. That's often one of the reasons why these families have such low income, because the work schedules are interrupted by these family responsibilities. All of that adds up to a lot of work disruption. One study found that 30% of low-income workers took time off work to attend to family care in a single study week, a very, very high percentage. Next slide, please. There's, these families tend to handle child care through a patchwork of care. And here I rely on Lisa Dodson's important work. Just to give you one example, this is of Emily, a divorced single mother who patched together different after-school arrangements every single day for her children who were nine and seven. On Monday after school, a neighbor walks them to school along with the neighbor's own kids to a youth center. Then that neighbor picked the kids up at five and walked them home. The older child, Flora, who's nine, has a key to their house and is in charge of her seven-year-old brother until Emily gets home between 6 and 7.30 p.m. On Tuesday, different arrangement. Emily's sister takes an early day from work. She picks up the kids, brings them to her house. 
but she can't afford to feed them. So they eat popcorn and watch TV until Emily can pick them up around 7.30, and then they take the bus home and eat dinner around 8.30. Wednesday, still a different arrangement. The kids walk two blocks to a bus stop. Their second grade teacher sometimes walks with them when she can. One of the bus drivers keeps an eye on them if he can, and he gets that shift. Then they go to their grandmother's house, but she can't come down to let them in. So again, Flora has a key, and if uh, one afternoon she couldn't get in, and the kids were reduced to shouting up to their grandma until a passerby helped them. Thursday is something different again. No one is available to help, and so the kids sit in school acting like they have business there, and then they go out to the playground when the school closes where they have to stay rain or shine for typically an hour. When it rains, Flora has found the deepest overhang so they can try to shelter, and she's also found a place where Teddy can, can pee in the playground if he needs to. Friday, Emily has an early day. And she, uh, it's very important to her. She says, if they took Friday away, I would, I would quit. But if you look at that schedule, which is not uncommon, these two kids, for them to get through the week, there's nine different adults whose schedules have to work. Next slide. So those are. That's what life looks like uh, among the bottom third. Among middle-income families, um, you're much more common to be two-parent families, although the, single, the number of single moms is sharply, sharply increasing, in part because the divorce rate is very high among these families. As we all know by this time, the wages of white middle-class men has fallen sharply, and that's putting extreme pressure on family life. But in fam two parent families, typical both typically both parents work full time. About a quarter of the dads work overtime. Sixty percent of the moms work full time or more. And that means the typical child care in these families is tag teaming, <clears throat> which means you have very serious problems when it comes to overtime, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Okay, so the that that's what's happening on the family side. Here's what's happening on the work side. These families face very rigid and very unstable schedules. All hourly workers face rigid schedules, and particularly in the bottom third, families also take, face very unstable schedules, so-called just-in-time schedules, which are very common in retail, hospitality, and health but more generally are very common among low-wage workers. Next slide, please. So what are these just-in-time schedules? They change from day to day and week to week, often with as little as three days' notice. So if you walk into a retail store, that's typically the kind of schedules that you're seeing, um, or a restaurant. People. Um, the problem is that the people these families rely on for child care often have the same unstable schedules that are changing all the time and also with very, very little notice. In addition, people are often sent home during their shifts or given arrive and given no hours. Next slide. The retail industry that where these Schedules, these just-in-time schedules are so prevalent, often engages in what I see as wishful thinking. Although they're only giving people part-time jobs, one study found that 94% of store managers, again, this was retail, said they hire for open availability. So even though the workers are being given part-time hours, 12 hours, 20, 20 hours, 25, um, the less the uh, definitely part-time, the only way to get hired is to say that you're available to work virtually any time. And so, of course, this puts workers in a bind where they have to fib in order just to get hired, and then they can't deliver because either they have child care responsibilities or they're managing two of these extremely unstable part-time jobs. Next slide. In addition, all hourly workers, and this includes middle class workers as well as low wage workers, have extremely rigid schedules. 
all of them are one sick child away from being fired. This isn't due in part to progressive discipline, to what are called no-fault no absenteeism policies, where individual workers are given points if they cannot arrive or arrive on time, and it, this is regardless of whether or not they're at fault for being late or their failure to arrive. What's started out actually is a progressive set of policies. This progressive discipline policies were definite improvement from being abruptly fired for your first infraction has have turned into real, real problems. For example, in one flagship department store, 80% of the associates in one department were on probation due to absenteeism. And you have to believe that if 80% of the workers are on probation, that there's something wrong with the way the underlying schedules have been designed in the first place. And if you ask the workers, as the researchers did, why this happens, it a lot of it is children. And a lot of it is, will I make it through the flu season this year? So if you think about these workers' schedules, they are extremely um, it's extremely difficult for them to arrive consistently to work when they have so little notice of their schedules. Also, I've read extensively union arbitrations involve our, involving hourly workers, divorced dads very often uh, uh, are, feel they, they must, um, uh, they, they must, for example, work overtime, but they can't or else they they risk losing custody of their children. Next slide. So is it just that these hourly workers are irresponsible? Here is a manager in Milwaukee interviewed by Lisa Dodson's team who linked massive absenteeism to irresponsibility. But then he, he um, rethought that and said usually it's linked to other irresponsible behavior even though that's not irresponsible, obviously you're being responsible to take care of your kids. And often the problem is not that these workers are irresponsible. It's that they have too many responsibilities that their employers are making believe that they don't have. That's really the source of this workplace workforce mismatch. Next slide. So I always say, next slide, please. So I always say that um, hourly workers have a lot of workplace flexibility, but it's called quitting. They quit one job after another when grandma has a crisis or when the child care breaks down. And this is terrible for employees. It's terrible for employers because it leads to very, very high turnover costs, which are described on this slide. One study found that in over 80% of retail stores, the turnover was more than 80% a year, and other researchers have documented turnover among just-in-time workers of up to 500% a year. Now, this is extremely expensive because the average replacement cost of an hourly worker is 30% of their annual salary. So if you just do the math, replacing 300 employees earning $20,000 a year costs $1.8 million a year. And this is, to quote Lisa Disselkamp, who's a management expert who specializes in this area, it's a lot of money for which the employer is getting nothing but headaches. Next slide. What you really have is a vicious cycle, just-in-time schedules lead to extremely high absenteeism as people can't arrange child care fast enough given the very little notice. And then the absenteeism typically causes the managers to cut everybody's hours more in order that they can have a higher number of workers on the roster to call when someone doesn't show up. But when the employee's hours are cut, then they have to go find another full-time job and leave or another part-time job, in which case you have employer number one competing with employer number two for the worker's 
availability. And the bottom line is what researchers have found is that the employers are inadvertently creating the attrition that they then manage around. Next slide. So the competitive edge is in controlling these costs, and they are possible. The best example is call centers. The turnover among call centers ranges, ranges from very low, 10%, to extraordinarily high, 400%. And what matters is wages to a significant extent, but what also matters is by giving these workers schedules that they can actually, uh, that are actually workable in terms of their lives. The labor costs average about 30% of the typical company's overall cost, yet only 16% of companies say they have a good command of the return on investment of their human capital expenditures. To quote Lisa Disselkamp again, employee scheduling is a skill that's rarely taught, but one that directly impacts the operational efficiency of the bottom line of any organization. And that's where the opportunity for American employers lies. Next slide. So here's the new competitive edge. Next slide. The conventional wisdom in just-in-time schedules is to focus on controlling costs, what I call the front-end labor costs. That the, the proposal, the just-in-time schedule idea, is to do that by achieving the tightest fit between labor supply and labor demand on the front end. That's the theory behind just-in-time scheduling. And the result is that for managers, very often, staying within your hours, in other words, not scheduling any more hours than the front office gives you, often is even more important than your sales stats in terms of the evaluation of a given manager. Next slide. On the other hand, controlling these front-end labor costs and this is what has not been recognized, too, too much. Controlling those front-end labor costs too much drives up back-end labor costs, drives up absenteeism, drives up turnover, drives up employee engagement, and also drives up, drives down, um, I'm sorry, drives down employee engagement, and it drives down productivity. Because if you are constantly, constantly hiring, you're hiring untrained workers, and the people who, you're, who are leaving are people who are trained. The, what's ironic is that what's going on is really a, a, a failure of business metrics. The front-end labor costs are being counted, but the back-end labor costs are not being counted. The reason is they're often seen as an inevitable cost of doing business. Again, these workers are just irresponsible. But I think when you look at the family patterns that these workers have, you come to the same conclusion as the manager in Milwaukee. It's not that these workers are being irresponsible. It's that they have family responsibilities that employers need to be taking into account for purely business reasons. Next slide. So here are some tools for employers to reassess whether their just-in-time scheduling is effective scheduling, because that's really the cost containment opportunity, is to make sure your schedule is effective. The first step is to survey your employees. One of the things that's really apparent if you read the studies and the arbitrations I have read is that there are several distinct groups of employees very often who need quite different schedules. The moms often need to be out by 2 so they can pick up kids at 3. On the other hand, in tag team families, you may have another group of parents who wants to start at 2 in order that they can work this later shift and the family can tag team. 
You have grandparents now, particularly now where it's so difficult and unaffordable for many people to retire, who want completely different schedules. And you have students who want completely different schedules. So it's very important <clears throat> to survey your employees so that you b begin to identify the pattern excuse me, of, uh, of the different kinds of schedules that your current employees need. Next slide. The second step is to find what Susan Lambert calls the hidden schedule, schedule stability. What Lambert found is that in two-thirds of the stores she was studying, and this was in a retail environment, 80% of the hours were stable. They varied only three hours from week to week. And yet, in order to be able to pin down that three-hour difference, Often employers delayed posting until a week or three days in advance, thereby, again, fueling this kind of schedule instability. So there's significant schedule stability in terms of the overall number of hours that a given location needs to staff. There's also considerable scheduling stability in terms of the times of day where workers are scheduled. I am now involved in a pilot study with Susan Lambert and the gap. And the, um, what we're finding is a considerable amount of stability also in terms of hours as well. OK. OK. Um, the, the third step is to lengthen the time that supervisors can stay within hours. This is the next slide. It's called staying within hours. My computer just cut out for some reason. Now, very often in these just-in-time environments, the supervisors have to stay within hours, and they're checked up on sometimes two, three times a day. If you have to meet a certain ratio, for example, of customers in the store to associates in the store, and you're, you have to meet that mark two or three times a day, you're very often going to have to send associates home if fewer customers show up than you expect. Or you'll have to send nursing assistants home if the patient's census is less. That really fuels instability in the schedule, and so the, the third step in creating more stability is to lengthen the amount of time supervisors have to meet those ratios between patient census, for example, and nurses' aides. If they can meet those ratios by the end of the week rather than by the end of the day, they have more flexibility to not send people home but to avoid call-ins at a later time. <clears throat> this is obviously harder with nurses, but in many other industries, that the lengthening the amount of time the supervisors have to meet, match labor supply and labor demand is very important. The fourth step is to determine the optimal number of employees and the optimal number of hours per worker. Um, they, one, in, one supervisor, and actually this is a common statement by supervisors in these just-in-time environments, to say that it's like flipping a coin, trying to figure out who is, going to who is going to show up on any given day. And one of the ways to decrease the turnover and increase the level of employee engagement is to give workers full-time hours if possible, and longer hours at any rate. Again, if you, give, if you keep cutting people's hours down, you're not only competing with their family care responsibilities, you're competing with the other employers that they are patching together in order to keep their families supported. Next slide. The fifth step is to determine the optimum amount of advance notice. This has actually been done by Susan Lampert in her studies. 
where she increased in the re retail context the amount of notice to from one um, from one week, I think it was, till a month. Many of the larger retailers in this country give only three days notice of next week's schedule. That's obviously a recipe for a bit of chaos. Next slide. It's very important once you provide that stability to at the same time provide for shift swapping. You need a formal system for handling schedule changes because babysitters get sick. A lot of things happen. People's schedules change. One of the things that we are exploring is real-time text-enabled shift swapping through cell phones so that someone, the babysitter doesn't show up, the baby is sick, grandma has a crisis. You can simply, by text message, text the other people in your work group asking if anyone can cover your shift. Typically, these workers are starved for hours, and so it should be easy once you have that system in place to enable real-time text-enabled shift swapping, which again would make workers' lives a lot easier and would ultimately save employers a tremendous amount of money. Next slide. The goal is scheduling, what I call scheduling equilibrium. It's to drive down the front end labor costs as much as possible without driving up those back end labor costs of turnover, absenteeism, lower productivity, and lower, lower working engagement. And in the Improving Work Life Fit in Hourly Jobs report, you have a very specific, detailed, step by step process by which an employer can come to recognize what is that equilibrium point where you're giving workers the maximum amount of stability that is feasible in your industry in order both to match labor supply and labor demand to a very significant extent, controlling those front-end labor costs, while at the same time controlling turnover, absenteeism, increasing worker engagement and productivity on the back end. That's really where the sweet spot lies, and I hope the report is helpful to employers in discovering that. So just a few resources. Final slide. I've been talking from the Improving Work-Life Fit in Hourly Jobs report. The data about families is in the three phases of work-family conflict report and in an early rep earlier report called One Sick Child Away from Being Fired. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. This is really, really helpful to lay out some of these best practices. And just a reminder to our participants, we will make these slides available to you after today's uh, presentation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Leticia Medeiros. She's also known as Letty, and she's the Director of Labor Policy and Advisor for U.S. Representative George Miller on the House Education and Workforce Committee. She focuses on economic security, job training, immigration, and women's issues. And she has a long history of leadership serving members of Congress. She's also worked as Chief of Staff to Representatives Michelle Lujan Grisham, Rosa DeLauro, and as a Legislative Assistant to Representatives Carrie Meek and Albert Wynn. Letty is known for her skilled work on legislation affecting women's security and the well-being of working families. In addition to her work with elected officials, she's also worked as an advocate in the private sector and was Vice President for Work and Family Programs at the National Partnership for Women and Families. She started her career as a teacher of American history at the College of Southern Maryland and also worked as a social worker at Gaithersburg Middle School in Maryland. Her master's degree is in American history from Rutgers University and it specialized in 19th century women's history. And her BA is in history and social work from Florida International University. We're so pleased that Letty can join us today to share information about pending legislation related to hourly workers. Letty, if you haven't already unmuted your phone, it's star six. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, thank okay. you. Fabulous. And uh, thank you to the presenters and to Joan um, for that incredibly detailed uh, take on, on the problem and how to how to fix it. Um, it was really instructive to listen uh, to her. Um, 
I, I want to talk about the perspective of some members of Congress and how they see it, how they have experienced, uh, uh, you know, listening to workers in their districts. Um, from from the standpoint of my current boss, Congressman George Miller, who many know is very passionate about uh, fairness in the workplace, um, he sees the scheduling issue as as a, a real nascent issue that's affecting people's quality of life, not just in, at work, but sp- you know spilling over their entire life, as as Joan also pointed out, um, and it's become evident that millions of Americans. Um, have no voice when it comes to their work schedule. Um, if you put the next slide that, that talks about the problem, I'll say a few words about that. Um, we know that people have always had to juggle responsibilities of work and family, but when people don't have a say in their work schedule, it's even more difficult to meet life's demands. When you don't know your work schedule, you cannot arrange child care or pick your kids up from school, and Jones touched upon that very, very explicitly. When you're on call 24-7, you can't be there to help take care of a sick or aging parent. When you're told you're not needed for a shift, you go home with no pay, you know, what kind of what kind of way is that of living? Um, you, you know, we've heard the stories of the, the difficulties it takes to some people to get to work. Um, take a bus, walk, take public transportation, uh, fill the gas tank with very expensive gas to get to work and be sent home. Also, more and more, employers post work schedules at the very last minute. Uh, Today, the boss expects workers to be on call 24-7, but then often doesn't schedule them to work. Shifts vary from week to week or day to day, and far too often, workers get sent home, as as we were saying. And erratic on-call scheduling, in my mind and in, in the mind of many of the members of Congress that are supporting this new legislation, this type of scheduling is worker abuse, plain and simple. And unfortunately, the people being abused are those who can least afford it, low-wage workers. These are the folks who work at our shopping malls, who cook and serve the food we eat, who clean our offices and the hotels we stay in. The retail, restaurant, janitorial, and housekeeping industries are driven by these workers most vulnerable to the problems of irregular and unpredictable schedules. So, with that in mind, um, you know, for as, as you mentioned, I, I've been involved in work family legislation for a while, thanks to my uh, uh, the opportunity I had to work for Congresswoman Deloro, who's a, a a champion of these issues. Always, always heard about this issue creeping up, maybe the past ten years, and the research uh, by Susan Lambert and others uh, shows, you know, that it's been an increasing practice um, that's always been there, but now it's just more pervasive. So in many, many conversations, many symposiums, many workshops, talking about whether it was minimum wage or the need for pay leave or the need for pay sick days, there was also this issue of irregular, unstable schedule, lack of flexibility, um, retaliation for requesting, you know, some flexibility at work. And um, it had been a, a dream of mine to sort of take it on and find some type of legislative fix or some type of legislative vehicle to talk about the issue. Um, And if you go to the next slide, um, the solution, dreaming big, I don't mean dream big because the bill is so um, radical. I mean dreaming big because we have started to envision a day when we can pass some type of legislation to act as a checks and balances on on these most abusive practices. So just in July... Uh, Congresswoman DeLauro and Congressman George Miller, with uh, strong support from Senators Harkin and Senator Warren, um, introduced the Schedules at Work Act. We've worked on this legislation for a year, which in the scheme of things, not so long, but it felt a very long time to try to get it right and to present three or four provisions that would get at the abuses. So under the bill... The employees are guarded from retaliation for requesting scheduling changes or a more stable schedule. The bill also creates a flexible process for considering requests that is responsive to the needs of both employees and employers. The bill says to employers that if you send someone home after they've shown up for work or change their schedule with less than 24 hours notice, it will cost you. 
and ensures that workers get their schedules two weeks in advance, and it discourages giving workers non-consecutive shifts. What we've heard is a common practice these days of split shifts. Um, and even, you know, federal agencies like the Transportation Security Agency schedules folks maybe four hours in the morning, four hours in the evening, um, and splits the shifts. I can't not even imagine what kind of havoc this this brings about in people's lives. The the, the justifying uh, justifying premise for this legislation is that good workers are a valuable resource, and successful businesses understand this in how they treat their workers and and how they view their workers as an asset, not just people that they will plug in or plug out whenever you know the the opportunity for profits. Um, Stand to soar. For Congressman George Miller, and I've heard them say many, many times, this is about dignity. It's about the dignity of work, and it is about the dignity of the individual. So this legislation gets at split shifts, advanced scheduling, um, going home, you know, after you've been scheduled, uh, in, in in those sectors that I mentioned, because. We wanted to start small and start with a sort of a demonstration program, a demonstration legislation um, where we had the research. We hope that in the next Congress, when it is reintroduced um, by Congressman DeLauro and Senator Warren and others, um, we may need to revise the legislation given the, the information that we may have. Um, so we are open to that. And if you move to the next slide, I can just talk about Next steps, um, we will continue to uh, build congressional support. I, I'm delighted to say that this may not sound like a lot, but we already have 40 members of Congress that are co-sponsoring this legislation. For a new piece of legislation that is breaking ground on an, on an issue that some people know about, other people don't, 40 members on a first out, outing is, is a very good start. Uh, from here on out, we will continue to, to expand. And I can tell you there's excitement in the committee with the committee staff and in other offices with the members of Congress about the way that this issue is continuing to gain national media attention. In July, we saw the New York Times, uh, I think it was maybe early August, cover a story about a woman that worked at Starbucks and how the regular scheduling affected her life and, and her life as a mother. And within a day, we saw Starbucks, um, you know, attempt to to correct their their practices. As the issue gains prominence, state and local initiatives can also build momentum for nationwide reform. And we are in the beginning stages of in, of engaging the current administration, um, with a view to take executive action wherever possible. And like I mentioned. We do intend, I, I know that Mr. Laura and Senator Warren intend to reintroduce this legislation in the next Congress and continue uh, continue the work. None of this happens overnight. It's a long-term project. Um, but we believe that the dream is to pass a new law that provides checks and balances, but we can also get there little by little uh, by adding pressure on, on the companies that are abusing uh, workers and, and putting pressure for them to change their policies at the state level and nationwide. So thank you so much for, for this opportunity, and, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Letty. We really appreciated that overview. And now before we go to questions, I'd like to introduce the Women's Bureau Director, Latifa Lyles, for closing remarks. Before joining the Women's Bureau, Latifa served as Vice President for Membership of the National Organization for Women, the nation's largest and oldest grassroots feminist advocacy group. And now she served as a principal media spokesperson on a wide range of women's issues and appeared on local and national radio and television, and she oversaw the organization's direct marketing program. Prior to her work with NOW, she managed the membership program at Public Justice the nation's largest public interest law firm, which specializes in a broad range of cases from employment discrimination to consumer protection. She's also served as co-chair of the Older Women's Economic Security Task Force of the National Council of Women's Organizations and on the Women's Coalition for Dignity and Diversity in Media. Ms. Lyles has extensive community and political organizing experience 
and she's been working in the social justice movement for over 15 years, beginning her work as a public policy associate for the Older Women's League, where she focused on economic security issues of midlife and older women. I'm so pleased that Latifa can join us today. Latifa, if your phone isn't muted, um, you want to hit star six to join us. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much, Kelly, for uh, your leadership and pulling this this um, workshop together. And thank you to all of the speakers, to Bridget O'Farrell, to Joan Williams, and to Liddy Medeiros. Um, we really do appreciate your ongoing um, collaboration, both in uh, helping us to get the word out about why these issues are so critically important to today's working women, and what we know on the in the area of uh, of research that point to the need for us to address these policies, and then, of course, um, the historical perspective on, you know, how long we have to go, but also, you know, the advent of some of these conversations, and, of course, some of the policy solutions that um, folks are working on to address uh, some of these really critical issues. I just wanted to quickly say that um, on behalf of the Secretary and the Department of Labor, um, what we do here at the Women's Bureau to make sure that we can, um, you know, we can support the, the work and the policies that can ensure women's uh, full participation in the labor force and in the, in the labor market, and that we do what we can to move forward or to lift up, lift up both employer voluntary practices and best practices and um, policy discussions and solutions that we believe will help um, women maintain their economic security. And certainly, um, as we talk more broadly about working families and in the past, some of our discussions around what folks typically think of as workplace flexibility, it's become extraordinarily um, important and really clear to us that we make sure that the conversations about um, the needs in the workplace of working families and people really do a span uh, the labor market and occupations. And certainly um, there has been a variety of issues that continue to to affect in a very in a, in a negative way several sectors of the labor force where we know women make up um, a disproportionate majority or a disproportionate uh, representation and certainly on the issues related to minimum wage and minimum wage jobs and certain hourly jobs and a lot of the just in time scheduling um, practices that Joan discussed certainly affect swaths of, of occupations where we know many women and many women who are supporting families are in those those jobs and in those occupations. And certainly, um, you know, people think of, you know, what kinds of policies and flexibilities uh, folks want to want in the job. And we're really talking about um, people being able to to depend on and to expect a certain number of hours, um, a certain amount of money, certainly our um, lifting up uh, good work around the country related to increasing the minimum wage is definitely part of this conversation. Um, but in addition to uh, raising wages and getting women into more of the higher paying and higher wage occupations, um, the amount of inflexibility on behalf of employers and, and unpredictability still does persist um, in, in too many areas and sectors. And we know that, um, as Joan pointed out and in some of her research and pilots, that she's working on um you know there really isn't a business case um that that is 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 supporting these 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 continuations of these practices and there's a lot that can be done looking at um you know promising practices technology and real solutions that we think will help uh move the ball forward so obviously um you know Kelly our leader out in California continues to work on the ground um within the regions within her um, her area to 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 bring together folks like you all on this call. So I want to thank you all for for participating. Um, we certainly have a plan for um, a, a, a variety of additional uh, similar conversations on var varieties of issues related to um, not only scheduling but paid leave policies. Um, certain occupational categories where we think women have opportunities to advance, and we hope that you will continue to uh, participate in these conversations with us moving forward. We will definitely keep you in the loop. We want to hear from you, um, and so I won't take up any more time, but do ask that 
um, you uh, stay connected with us in addition to the questions that you may have at the end of the call. But again, thanks everybody for your participation, and I hope that you can uh, stay connected with us. And uh, we have a new website that we just launched as a result of the Working Family, not as a result of, but on the day of the Working Family Summit, we worked really hard to get our new website up and revamped, and it is our goal to make sure that we can continue to be in a much more comprehensive way a major resource for not only working women, but those who advocate for working women, and that includes a variety of resources and information, not only um, in terms of research and data, but real practical solutions for individuals um, in terms of getting what they need from the federal government throughout the throughout the, the government, not just in the Department of Labor. So our website is www.dol.gov slash forward slash WB. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you so much, Latifa. Um, if you have a question and you'd like to pose it to one of our speakers, please use the chat box on the bottom of your screen. You can just type in a little question there and submit it, and we'll pose it to one of our speakers. Um, let me see if Joan is um, available to take a question. Joan, are, are there um, managers at the local establishment level are they generally able to implement some of the changes that you talked about for just-in-time scheduling practices, or are these policies generally handed down from corporate management? I think it really varies. Um, what we're finding is that there a lot of this is actually going on offline, so uh, it's not as part of the formal HR system. So, for example, in many large employers, the employees have a Facebook page at individual stores where they are already swapping shifts informally. So the challenge then is to bring that shift swapping in, uh, in to generalize it and make it more accessible to a lot of people. Another thing that can be implemented at an individual enterprise level has to do with allocation of overtime. For example, when I was writing the Improving Work-Life Fit report, I found two different systems and already in use with respect to overtime. Of course, overtime is a huge problem for single moms. It's a huge problem for tag team families because you have to choose between mom's job and dad's job in a context where the family needs both just to pay the rent. And so one system is to divide the workforce into four groups and have group one on call for overtime the first week of every month, group two the second week, et cetera. What you find is that it's far more feasible for people to arrange backup childcare for one week a month but it's completely impossible for every day of the year, and so they just give up. Another way to allocate unexpected overtime is to give people a number of basically credits at the beginning of the year, and they can earn more for excellent performance. And those credits can be used, used either to bid for more hours or to bid for fewer hours in a given week. Again, this is a way of addressing the fact that some people just want as many hours on a given week as they can possibly have. And other people, if they are, have to work unexpected hours, will basically give up on the job because they simply can't leave their children home alone and be arrested for child neglect. It's just not an option. So I have had employers implement that uh, one of those overtime systems, you know, hear me give a talk, speech and the next day they go implement that overtime system. If you're an organization that works with hourly workers and your workers are having challenges surrounding shift swapping, the Facebook page is another thing that can be done immediately with respect to, to shift swapping. That's great. Um, what about recommendations for employees that are struggling with these just-in-time scheduling practices, what would you suggest that they might do to improve their situation? The problem is it's very difficult for an employee to really intervene, and that's why it's 
some of us are working with businesses and others of us are working at a public policy level. Mm-hmm. Ideally, actually, you know, ideally the bottom line is to do a really great job and show up when you say you're going to show up and keep asking for more hours. And that's going to work for some people. Unfortunately, it's pretty weak tea. So at the Center for Work Life Law that I run, we really try to give people both individual strategies as well as working on institutional solutions. But the individual strategies here are often just not very feasible for people who absolutely cannot leave their children home alone, or if grandma has a diabetes crisis and needs to go to the hospital, they must do it. And that's why these solutions at the institutional level, either public policy or by organizations, are so very important. Right. So, you know, with with that uh, challenge, it kind of points to, you know, the need for to, for looking at public policy and legislation. Um, Lenny, I have a question for you. As, you know, this progressive legislation and other legislation is debated, mm-hmm. we often hear that critics charge that these, methods, that these kind of measures are just job killers. And I'm wondering if you've heard that charge or other criticism leveled at this legislation and, and how, you know, you and the members of Congress are responding to that. The, we, we have heard, you know, similar, similar charges, uh, mostly in the, in the news articles. When reporters uh, ask, you know, uh, the restaurant association, retail, um, sort of uh, similar arguments that, you know, the sky will fall and it will be the end of businesses as we know it, um, that you've heard maybe 20 years ago during FMLA or the same arguments that are waged against um, increasing labor standards like paid sick days. Um, But um, I don't don't think those those are fair. fair charges this bill is modest and it goes to the uh it goes universally it goes to the flexibility issue on a universal basis uh, for this pro- proactive uh process i was describing in which there's a request to receive flexibility and a right a, a request and the right to receive and but the other the other versions the other provisions of the bill are very targeted to you know three or four occupations that we know are engaging in these um, abusive tactics of scheduling. Um, so, as, as I mentioned, if if a business sees their employees as an asset and as a resource, they they will not engage in these practices. Okay, thank you. So we do have one question from our audience. In this, this is asking, Joan. I wonder if I could um, weigh in on the prior question. That oh, sure. Job Please go ahead. I think what my study and others have shown is that that's just downright an inaccurate statement. The reason these seem like ex- they seem expensive is because what's going on in many industries today is a case of flawed business metrics. The businesses are counting only the front-end labor costs, and they are not counting the back-end labor costs. Mm-hmm. If they count the back-end labor costs, they would, in fact, break even or be saving money if they give people more stable schedules. And I think it's very important, both from a business standpoint and from a public policy standpoint, to say chapter and verse that is simply an inaccurate statement fueled by flawed business metrics. Okay. Thank you for for adding that. Um, we do have a question that's come in from one of our attendees, and I'm thinking, Joan, this might be directed to you. Um, it's what is the correlation between inconsistencies in work schedules and employee safety? And is there a frequency of inju- injury that's higher among the demographics mentioned um, in those working you know, in just-in-time schedules? And if so, what are the most prevalent injury trends? I'm only familiar, this is Joan, with the general um, research that 
working long hours of overtime correlates both with worker injury and to higher rates of miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So that's been that is a robust finding in the liter in the literature on overtime. And that's a, another good example of the kinds of costs that are occur, uh, that are that accrue from lack of effective scheduling, but those costs are often coded as inevitable costs of doing business because, well, you're just going to have accidents happen. That's true, but not at the same level as if you aren't working people to the bone. Wow. Liddy, have, um, have any of the research that you've done on the legislation, have you seen anything that addressed the injury rates as well? Um, I've seen, you, you know, the, um, the contingent workforce issues mm -hmm. um, and temp workers, which the, this legislation uh, does not address, um, but it could in the future. Um, there, there's having some serious impact in terms of health and safety. Um, and there's been some recent reports um, about, you know, putting folks in, in, in a job that they're not fully trained for um, and the consequences of that. Okay, thank you. So I think we're going to um, end our call with just one last question. I think we have Bridget back on the phone. Um, Bridget, can you address for us how the President's Commission on the Status of Women looked at the issue of overlapping race and gender discrimination. Uh, yes, I, uh, two things. One, just to comment on the uh, earlier uh, questions which I was able to uh, listen to, and just to remind people that many of the arguments being presented against the scheduling and the flex time are very similar to arguments that employers presented back in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, when they didn't have good data and they didn't present uh, you know, the actual accurate effects. And one of the things the commission did, which was so important, with several studies, and they commissioned um, several uh, studies to actually go out and talk to employers and talk to women and to document. So I think the kind of work that Joan and others are doing is just continues to be extremely important to have facts uh, to counter some of the, uh, the things that are, are just, you know, put out there as fact when, in fact, uh, they really aren't. Uh, in terms of women of color, the commission was, at, the, at its time, very uh, forward-thinking. And uh, Esther Peterson, as well as uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and many of the commissioners were very aware that while women were facing discrimination in the workforce, there was also uh, the civil rights movement was uh, gaining great momentum at that time. And there was an awareness of uh, the concerns, particularly for African-American workers, but it often focused on the men. And so that uh, African-American women seemed to sometimes just their issues were not addressed. And so the commission took that up as a very important challenge, that they specifically addressed uh, issues for African-American women. And it was somewhat limited to that group. There were certainly uh, women of many other ethnic uh, and racial groups but um, this, at the time, was the largest, uh, the largest group. Dorothy Height, who was president of the National Council of Negro Women, was one of the commissioners. Uh, and while they had a, a basic uh, agreement that issues for women of color would be covered in every aspect, in you know, all of the separate uh, committees that were formed, uh, that they would address issues of race, they also decided that it was important to pull those issues together. And so one of the four consultations and uh, conferences that they held was focused on uh, issues for African-American women. And they then, again, in the final report, uh, in, in several different places and particular issues, like with domestic workers, they noted uh, you know, the number of minority women who were in that category and the special and the issues that uh, that they faced. So I think it was um, particularly uh, uh, notable that in the 19, early 1960s, these issues uh, were being brought forward, and it was also attributable to um, some of the labor women, like Lillian Hatcher, who came out of the UAW, and uh, this African American and Carolyn Davis uh, from the UAW 
who uh, brought many years of the experience of dealing with uh, racial discrimination in the workplace. Uh, but what was unique at the time was that then they specifically focused on uh, the barriers and the issues for women of color in the workplace. And that was quite unusual at the time. Okay. Well, thank you for providing that perspective, Bridget. Um, that's all the time that we have for today. I, I appreciate those of you who were able to stay uh, on the call as we went a little bit over our scheduled time. I want to thank all of our speakers and all of our attendees for joining us today. And as Latifa had mentioned, you can stay connected with us by signing up for alerts, subscribing to the Department of Labor newsletter on the main DOL.gov website. We hope you enjoyed the program, and we will follow up with you to share additional resources. A very good afternoon to everyone. Bye-bye.